Okay, so we went through, um, you know, this uh, the layout of the subsea system. We went into a bit roughly, but how do you decide between dry and wet tree? Okay, which is very important for deciding which offshore structure I'm going to use. And there were a few things pending, okay, that that we have to cover today. So one of them is uh, the storage capacity. of the offshore structure. Okay. And that's related to remoteness, is related to weather condition, is related to so here it's uh, accessibility. Okay. Maybe during part of the year is not accessible due to ice, due to rough weather. Um, rough weather, okay. Um, other thing might be some stability issues in the country, so um, political issues. Um, so because of that you need to have maybe you need to account for some storage capacity in the offshore structure so as I mentioned before which are the only structures that really can have some storage capacity is the king is FPSO okay and it can go all the way from 1 million Okay. One million standard barrels all the way to three. And the other structure that has storage is the gravity based structure. And that usually has a bit less. I think its uh, numbers are around 150,000 to 300,000. Okay, and lately, usually spars don't have much storage. Okay, the first um, spar that will have storage is actually the Osta Hansten spar, which is going to be here in Norway. And I think that will have a condensate capacity of 150,000 barrels. Okay, because the, the spar, the gas is mainly it's a gas field, gas condensate will have some condensate, so you need to have some storage to store the, the condensate in the meantime when the tanker is coming and picking it up. Okay? But basically there we don't have much choices. Okay? You of course you can have a tanker which is always there, but if there is a problem with with the tanker to access the field, then you're in trouble. You have to shut down production. Okay? So that's something also to keep in mind. And then the last part I want to discuss today, and with that we close a bit offshore structure, is about marine loads on the offshore structure. which switch <laughs> okay marine loads on offshore structure and that's the last part we have to discuss okay Be because that's very important to select the type of structure we are going to use so we know in a general way if we put an offshore structure just some sort of a box okay that's the structure then we know here we have the sea surface someplace here there are three 
types of loads that also due to the marine environment that typically impact or that typically you know hit this structure so one of them it's um, the current okay and the current typically have something like that okay then of course we have the wind so that's the current then also you have the wind. Okay. And lastly you have the waves. Okay. And that's what we are going to focus here on this class. We have one one last load which is the waves. Okay. And it is that this structure, so they and we already know because it's uh like a almost like a chaotic or it's like a, a natural process you don't have a fixed load here with a fixed frequency okay you have something that is changing varying with time therefore the response of the structure and here you can think about different types of resp responses okay depending on for example how the structure is if we assume if we assume the structure is like a platform Okay, it's a fixed platform. Okay, we can then approximate, can say, well, the movement will be something like that, like a bar recessed on the seabed, for example. Okay, and with the movement, it's going to move, it's going to oscillate, something like that. Okay. When we refer to, for example, has a floating, has a boat or a ship, a floating structure, we there have a few, let's make it a bit more three-dimensional. Okay, let's make it maybe something like that. Okay, what do we have in a, like a floating type structure? We have one big, uh, one very that people are very concerned about, which is heave. Okay, is the movement simply oscillating up and down. You have movement in this direction, which is called, is called surge. Okay, you have movement in this direction okay which is called sway okay and then you have also the rotation on each one of these directions okay that how do we call those so we have pitch we have roll, roll and we have huh? okay so this is roll is it yeah this is roll I think this is pitch and this one is okay. Correct. I think there is no L. Yeah. No L. I mean, isn't pitch and yaw the other way around? I I think so. Yeah. Let me check. I always mix both of them. <laughs> I always mix both of them. Yes, that's correct. So this one should be. And that's not Noel here. Peach. So Peach is Peach is this one. And this is your. Okay? So the thing is that we're going to have a load, okay? A, a load on that structure. And after that we're going to get a response. We're going to get a, a response in time. Again, that's what we are really concerned to see the response, the movement, and the movement will cause some stresses on the structure. And we simply have to make sure that the structure is going to hold. Okay, so we're looking for is like we're looking for uh, these are forces or loads, okay, or marine loads on the structure. Then we have some structure, 
and at the end we have the movement okay this will be in time and that will also be in time and with the movement you want also to compute the stresses on the structure and you want to be sure that the structure will keep its integrity during the whole life of the field okay and there are two types of calculations that we typically made we first make a maximum stress calculation okay in which you see if there is a very big event where you have these marine loads are very very high like you have a storm or something like that very high loads that your structure is going simply to hold okay and there is another calculation which is long term that is related to fatigue okay that if i i have like a cycle with more or less the same loads over and over and over again the material has some certain limited amount of cycles that it can take that load okay after a some amount of cycles is going to is going to fail mm -hmm. so we're going to be looking a bit mostly into that part okay how do we characterize that part of the equation okay these these loads and we are going to be very shortly how do we do that part how with all of those loads we are going to compute what happens here okay yeah. okay and also one thing is not only important to characterize the magnitude okay Okay, but it's also important to characterize the the cyclic nature, okay? The the how often it repeats. And that we can do with with a variable called frequency. Okay? Frequency of the load. It's not the same to have a very big load but being very slow coming at at very low very separated periods of time or to have a short load which might be smaller but can is more often okay they will have different effect on the structure so these two things are the ones we are going to take a, a very short look into that okay to see what is important so on the lows we have here basically we have wind okay we have current and also we have waves okay and we're going to be focusing mostly on waves wind typically i have to let me see if I took that figure. Maybe not. Okay. Wind we typically use for, for our calculation for designing the offshore structure. If it's not that a big part of the structure is exposed to wind, or or if it's not a floating structure. We typically took take wind as fixed, and we took simply the highest the highest uh, value. Okay, so let's see. Okay, but wind is very important to take into account the direction of where the wind is coming from. Okay, like you say here is like a frequency diagram. We have made four different directions. If you try to break that diagram and you put it flat, you will see exactly what you have done in class that you are taking the frequency of occurrence from each direction and in this case it tells you well most of the wind is flowing most of the time from the southwest and from the west from that structure and the color code tells you the magnitude how is that wind composed on that direction okay from that direction is mostly composed by so uh, slow moving winds 2 to 16 but a little bit from 40 to 55 okay high speed winds so but it's often considered constant okay for for some structures unless they are floating or they have a very big exposed part so we're not going to look too much into those okay for wind okay direction of wind okay. then we have current in which also we do a similar it is not affecting too much we can use uh, a fixed value 
okay? But we like to take into account the variation with depth of current, especially for structures that have a big exposed part, a big exposed hole, hole like this part, okay? But now on waves, wave is something that is relevant for most of them, for most structures. So that's why I want to focus my discussion on, okay? So here, uh, a, fixed ever, a fixed value is typically used for design. Okay. And the current Okay, but we we are going to look more closely into waves. Okay, and basically waves are change in elevation of the sea of the sea level. Okay, that are impacting the structure. They are propagating. They are moving towards the structure, and they are impacting the structure. And a profile, a wave profile, looks very relatively random, okay? Very, very often you cannot detect a change, so that will be the mean sea level, okay? And you have, basically, it's a variation on the elevation of that level at one position, okay? And it can be very different varying... can be varying very, very much. Elevation, we use this letter called the set, Greek letter called set, okay? We can use also set with time. <clears throat> so, remember we are looking for not only the magnitude, okay, of that wave, but we are also looking, trying to find for some indication of frequency, okay, of cyclic, what is the repeatability of that signal. So, how do we do that for a signal that looks apparently random, that you see it and doesn't, you don't recognize any pattern? I guess you took one course in math where they explain that. Who was this bright, uh, bright, brilliant mathematician, French, who said any signal you can use a sum of sines and cosines? Yeah. Who was this guy? Lagrange. French guy. Yeah. Fourier. Okay. Rings any bell? Okay, so Fourier, he basically, and that's what we basically use. He said, well, any signal, no matter how random it looks like or how different from a sign looks like, can be reconstructed by a sum of sine and cosine. Yeah, and depending on the complexity of that signal, I will need to use more or less components. Okay, but it will be simply say, any signal that I have FT can be simply made by a sum of from i equal 1 to maybe infinite, okay, but we are going to use discrete, just a discrete number of components of an amplitude times the sine. You have here an angular frequency times, and then you have a shift factor, okay? So that's the amplitude of the signal, and here you have the angular frequency. Okay, and that simply, if you look at the components, right, you, you can simply say that one of the is regular, okay, it's simply a sine wave, okay, but then you sum up with another, which is maybe like that, also regular, shorter period, okay. And then you sum it with something like that. Also regular. And at the end it gives you, so this one. Okay. Plus this one, plus this one gives you something that looks exactly like our signal or like our wave signal is looking like. Okay. For example, okay? so that's the whole 
concept behind that. We have a signal we cannot recognize just with the naked eye. We cannot recognize a period from there. So let's use this, this concept, this mathematical concept, to decompose the signal by its, you know, its, um, its uh, components. Okay? We try to calculate all the components of the signal. What is it made of? Okay. <clears throat> so for that we use um, a, um, a procedure called FFT, okay, which is called a fast Fourier transform. Did you see that? Did you cover that in any course in math before? No? Yeah? Then most of some of you should have at least some, at least you heard of it, okay? But basically I take that signal with time, I apply the FFT, and what do I find from this process? I find something that is called the spectrum of the signal, frequency spectrum of the signal, where you have on the on the x axis you have the frequency what is the frequency frequency is the inverse of the period right but also how is it related to the angular frequency one, one uh, divided by 2 pi right yes. so the angular frequency is the frequency divided by, that's the frequency divided by 2 pi, right? Because frequency is in cycles and a cycle is 2 pi in radians. Yeah? Okay. So what you're going to get here is something also a bit strange, okay? You're not going to get exactly this amplitude in physical meaning, okay? If you see that equation, this amplitude actually is in meters, okay? But you don't get, with the FFT, you don't get that amplitude. You call something called a spectral energy. Okay. And you get, which is related to the amplitude, by anybody remembers the equation? No? Okay, so the spectral energy, we use the letter S, I, will be related to the amplitude by, so the amplitude I will be 2 times the spectral energy times delta WI, square root of that. Okay, so that's the elevation and that's the spectral energy. Okay, but basically it's representing the amplitude of that part of the signal. So you're going to get for some of them, for some of the WI or the FI, okay, they're going to be relatively low. And it's discrete, okay, so you will have just a number for each, for, the, for a few numbers, okay. But for some of them it's going to be very, very high, and it's going to usually is going to be grouped around a peak, okay? A value which has the maximum spectral energy. And that means that the energy is made up mainly depending on the spectrum. If the spectrum is very spread, it means that it's made by different signals, okay? But if it's all of them is, is very narrow and is pointing through a main dominant frequency that tells you that wave has a dominant, a dominant frequency, a dominant component of amplitude and also of of frequency okay and that basically that's how i can take in waves that's how i can take that signal which seems very very random okay that's how i can decompose and try to assign a unique amplitude and assign a unique uh, uh, frequency okay a dominant this will be the dominant frequency Okay, or we call also the spectral peak. 
spectral peak period okay which simply is the period remember is simply one over that frequency okay so that's an, a term we use we use for that so we take our wave signal we apply FFT we find the spectrum and finally we recognize this peak spectral um, uh, period okay so actually you're going to have an exercise today we're going to make in class you're going to make it I will help you where um, and that by the way exercise set four is finished okay so I will the deadline will be in in two weeks it will be in two weeks but you have that problem and you have this problem in which you were on a boat okay that was gathering data for a period of of, a, of a, almost an hour okay and now you have that data and you have to apply this frequency analysis you have to perform an FFT and you have to plot the spectrum you have to recognize the spectral peak period the data it's uh, is here and you can see how it looks like Okay, so here you have the data measure was measured every half a second and you have also the plot of the elevation how is it changing okay so you see there in that case the, the signal was more or less regular looks more or less there is a pattern inside okay but your main task now for today and for the exercise it will be to apply the FFT we can do FFT in Excel okay don't be you know it's, it's surprising but it's we can do FFT in Excel and from there we can get uh, the, 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 the spectrum of the signal and then we can get this peak period. Now the thing is that that's going to change, okay? That peak will change with time. The C won't be keeping always at the same peak, it will change the peak, okay? <coughs> so what we consider is that we consider that things remain more or less constant okay that means uh, an assumption is made that the peak spectral period called TS okay forgot maybe to put the S here TS is relatively constant for a C state okay what we call a C state and a C state basically use different numbers but typically we use three hours okay that means the duration of a storm we see a C state is not going to change significantly like in our case we took our boy on the ship then we measure for three hours and we said well the peak is going to be that another C state another three hours it will have probably another peak it might have the same peak but it, it, it will have probably will have another peak okay so that's one thing we record for that three hours period but remember we not only need that but we also need the magnitude of the load okay here we have the psych the 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 transient performance of the of the load okay of the wave but we also need the magnitude and for the magnitude what we are most concerned or, or what we use is not elevation in terms of magnitude
instead of elevation, we use wave height, okay? And the wave height, if we look again at the elevation plot, what is the wave height? Okay, the wave height is the distance or the difference between a consecutive peak and a valley. Two valleys that are next to each other. So in that case will be these two. Okay, that will be the wave height. And you will change. You have here one more. You have here one more. So it will change just like the amplitude. That will be H. Okay? And that's the variable that we use to characterize the C. Instead of elevation, we use the height. Okay? Now, for elevation, okay, typically we say the elevation on that C state the, it displays uh, a normal distribution. A Gaussian distribution, okay? In a C state, elevation set, okay, displays a normal distribution. Okay? That means if you make a PDF probability distribution function of the set, it will simply you have that and that zero it will simply be a round zero, a normal distribution, okay, around that, that value. Now, with the height, is something different. With the height, if you make the PDF of the, of the height, of the wave height, sorry, that's PDF and this is H, okay, typically it behaves like a Raleigh type distribution. Okay, something like that. Actually, like that. Okay, and that's normal distribution, but H is a Rayleigh. How do you write Rayleigh? Um, forgot. Right. Rayleigh. Is it? Or with a T maybe at the end? No. Okay. But that's how it distributes. So the number we use, you see, it can have very different values, okay, the H. So just by the value that people use is something called the significant wave height. <coughs> okay, it's called HS, okay, and it simply is the average of height in the range from H max, okay, which H max you might have some place here, all the way to two thirds of H max. Okay, so some place all the way here. And that's simply by convention, okay? They say we have to use a representative number for that wave height, so we're going to use simply the average on that, on that, um, on that range, okay? Okay, so with these two numbers, we characterize the C state. The spectral peak that you find it through, um, through uh, making an FFT of the signal, okay, of the measurements you have, and uh, you calculate the HS also from the data you have, or if you don't have data, uh, you can calculate from the elevation. That's what actually you have on the on the exercise. Okay, you can compute if the wave elevation has a normal distribution and the wave height is a Rayleigh distribution without the i. Okay, the significant wave height can be expressed as HS equal four times the standard deviation of the elevation. That means if you calculate the standard deviation of the wave elevation, you can find this significant wave height. Okay? And that's it. That's how you characterize one C state. 
okay now what happens if in time okay we know that it's going to change so we have to make so we have to measure okay typically we have to measure we have to measure wave elevation data okay approximately the time is used is two years for about two years of the area okay where I'm going to have my field of the area and I have to compute in these two years how many C states do I have a lot okay it's three hours we have to calculate the number of hours per year so it's uh, 24 times 365 okay and then we divide by 3 okay and then we multiply by 2 a okay? number of C states Is that correct two years 24 hours 365 no 64 unless we live in an alien planet with and then divided by 3 how much is that thing is something like 290 something to fifty-eight or okay okay C states and what I have to do then I have to start making frequency analysis on this data in all of that data and how it how does it look like um, and here I have go back should take a break Okay, like for example, this is for the area where the Osta Hanstein will be, okay, or, or is currently now. Uh, you can build a, a map. Here is showing the number of occurrences. Here you see on the y axis you have the significant wave height, okay, in a range. The center of that range will be 17.5. That's the significant wave, wave height of that range. And then you have all other range from biggest to smallest. And then you have on the x-axis, on the top, you have the spectral peak period, this TS, that you have found by making this FFT on your, on your elevation data. And it can go all the way from 0 to 3 seconds, all the way to 25. And then you start counting how many times this combination has happened. Okay? You want from this number, 5,800, you count, you count, you count, and this color is indicating where you have the most combinations okay so for that see what is the most likely combination that will happen okay is there is 18 so it's between 8 and 9 seconds and it's between 1 and 2 meters so that's the most likely combination of period and significant height that will occur in the place where the Osta Hanstein is located You can also see that for if you pick a TS, okay, or a TP, if you pick one, you have one significant height, which is the most likely, okay, which is the most. So that's how we characterize uh, the the C, okay. That's how we characterize the place where it's gonna be, the structure, okay. Now to see why do we care about that okay let's take a break and then let's take the last part that is how we transfer that to movement okay we know that's going to cause some movement some stresses on my structure and i'm not going to give you the whole story it might you know it, it, we don't it, it will take too long time but i just want to tell you very roughly how does it affect on the selection of the structure okay so let's take a break and come back uh, yeah. 1117 okay um, so just one mistake here that uh, good thing that people are awake 
this uh, 2 times pi, okay? Because we have frequency cycles per second, and uh, there are 2 pi radians in one cycle, okay? So I have to put cycle up, cycle down, and then radians up and, and down. Okay, um, so now we know how we create these statistics, and this is actually the um, a diagram that we use for different seas, okay? And each sea, each region of the world has a different map and has a different a spectral period, peak period, and a significant height, okay? Now, how is that affecting? Remember, at the end, we are saying, where is it? Here, okay, we have characterized that. How do we characterize? And fo we were focusing on wave, okay? That is going to have impact on the structure, and the structure is going to exhibit movement, and it's going to exhibit stresses, okay? So, for that, we use to calculate movement and stress, okay, of the offshore structure, to calculate and stress of the offshore structure, we typically use laboratory test Okay, like for example, you have here, anybody coming here from the marine department? Anybody has seen the pool in the marine department? Yeah, if you have a friend, you know, just tell him to take you there. If they're not doing any confidential experiment, it's very impressive, okay? And they run tests on small scale of, of different offshore structures, and they try to quantify if you have some excitation, some HS and some uh, uh, some TP, what will be the response, or we can also use numerical simulation, okay? But something we have to be very careful, okay? Every structure has something that we call a natural frequency. Okay, and that frequency is when if I, if I excite the structure with that frequency, it will exhibit maximum amplitude, it will exhibit maximum movement, okay, at which it exhibits maximum Okay, and which we can assume that we have maximum stresses, and that will cause, if the structure is going to fail someplace, probably will be there. Okay, and I think I have a diagram. I took it from a presentation from Statoid, from Equinor. And also, I think this one I took from a publication, from a paper but basically telling you what are the natural periods of that structure, okay? So you have here on the right side for different structures, Jacob, Jacket, these are basically oscillations like that. TLP, you have also, um, you have heave, you have roll, and you have pitch, okay? And spar, you have heave, is much higher, okay, so on a higher period. Semi-sub is a big box, okay, also heave, roll, and pitch. So they have natural frequencies that are around that, that those values, okay? So if we have different types of excitations, okay, which we have waves, wind, we have earthquake, they have also a range where they occur, also depending on the region, okay? For example, in our region we have here, we have more in the range between 9 and 10, okay? So we are going to be more around this C, okay? Which gives you no trouble for, for any structure. But if you have, for example, on that particular C, you have that your frequency, that your period is has this value, that might be an issue because it will excite, will create a lot of movement on your structure. Movement means more stresses. 
more stresses means risk to, of failure okay so that you have to co take into account when you are uh, designing your structure okay stay away so you have the TP or the most frequent TP of the area okay should be far away from the natural period of the structure okay so that's also something that restricts a bit which which structure do we use so for the exercise you're going to get you have a way that that's measured if people using either models or using laboratory measurements they create um, a response amplitude operator okay in that case is a is a ratio between what they measure in the lab okay or what they compute with the model the heat in that case of the structure and you have different structures a drilling sheet a spar etc divided by the amplitude of but divided by the amplitude of the most dominant wave okay so you see here, for example, uh, you see you have these peaks. That's what we want to avoid. Okay. So for example, that structure <coughs> is this trendsetter. So if you are exciting with five, ten seconds, fifteen seconds, nothing happens. Okay. But when you start exciting around twenty, then it becomes maximum. That means that you are, if you are hitting with a wave of let's say one, okay. How much do you get in that point? A movement. In that case, I think it's heave, okay? So it's simply that movement of 1.8 times that that height, okay? That means if I excite with one meter wave, then I will have 1.8 movement in the heat maximum, okay? So your next, next task on this, um, on the exercise, will be so first you have to make um, the FFT of the data okay, that you have here that's the data with time there is a procedure how to make FFT in uh, Excel which I have also given you you have to read okay the, the idea is to find that chart that tells you what is the dominant frequency of the signal and then the next part of the question is taking that that the the most frequent the the dominant amplitude of my signal okay i have to try to predict what will be the heave on different type of structure okay fpso spar and semi sub using this chart okay and this is the ratio between the heave and the amplitude Okay, for different frequencies. So you have to find what is your peak frequency, you have to find what is the dominant amplitude, and then you have to multiply by the ratio. Okay, very simple. And the last one is to compute the HS, which you could also do it manually. Okay, you can try to make the plot by computing peak minus valley of the signal and then you make a frequency analysis of that and then you integrate in the H in this range okay that we discussed before okay you calculate H H you make a frequency analysis and then you calculate the mean it's not the average is the mean okay or you can use the equation or you can use the equation that was provided which is much simpler that is four times the standard deviation of the elevation data okay okay so uh, I had planned to to um, to go through uh, flow assurance today okay to start on that topic 
but I think I will give you some time to work on the exercise, okay, here in class. In case you have any questions, I can help you going around. Uh, but I suggest you work on that, this exercise. And I have given, so the third problem is about our discussion yesterday, okay, about the routing problem. You have five subsea whales that they are grouped in two templates, three in one and two in the other. And I have the option to flow to separator one or separator two on the platform. So the first step, you have to make a sketch and you have to consider the two options. You have only two lines going to the platform or you have four lines going to the platform. And you have to make a sketch how the system looks like in both. And then the next step is that these whales, let me open uh, the Excel file. Okay, these wells they have different oil production, they have different gas production, and they have different water cut. Okay, so you have to find a way. The way they are connected now, it doesn't tell you. Okay, but the way they are connected now, they have to is bottlenecked, so they have to choke production. They cannot produce exactly these numbers that I have here. Okay, so you have to find a way where to which separator do you send which well such that you honor the constraints of gas and water and also you the oil production is more or less even is more or less equal between the two separators okay so that those are the last two problems of exercise set four okay deadline in uh, so two weeks from now will be 29th of march okay so I suggest before, instead of going into a new topic today, just you work on the exercise. And if you, I will be here to answer questions if you have any. But um, if you agree, unless you want to, you want to skip the exercise and yeah, and cover more material. Okay, and you can work on any problem of these two, but basically remember how many options do we have to connect. If we have four wells, uh, five wells, and well five, okay, I did, and you have then two separators, separator one and separator two. Okay, so how many options do I have to connect? Uh, how many possible combinations do I have? Okay, I could connect one to one and all the rest to two, right? But then I could connect two to one and all the rest to two, and then I can connect. So I have many, many combinations. How? So you will have to find a way to compute all of those combinations automatically okay <coughs> how many combinations do we have no? is so I have two options right for each whale I have only two options I can go to separator one or separator two for whale one and I have also the same two options for well two, which can be combined with the two options of well one. Okay? Then I have in well three I have exactly the same two that can be combined with any case from well one and two. Okay? Well four I have again the other two that can be combined with any of the other of well one and two. Let's say here you say separator one or two. Again also one or two. One or two, one or two. Okay, so if I choose one, this can be combined with this one or with this one, then with this one or with this one, this one and this one. Okay, and finally, well, five, I have two more, so at the end, I end up with two to the power of five, which is 
32. Not many, okay? We can do by hand. <coughs> okay? If there are some systems that they have many, many wells, so that can increase dramatically, okay? But in our case, we is manageable. So you have to find these 32 combinations, and what I suggest, you can evaluate each one of them and calculate the Q gas, Q oil, and Q water of each separator. Okay, and you have to be sure that these are these two are below the maximum. So Q water of one max. Q water of one should be below. And Q water of two max should be below. And the gas also the same. Q of gas one max. And at the same time, you want the Q oil in one to be more si similar to Q oil in two. You want them to be balanced, okay, the production. Okay, let's see. We can come back to this problem later when we talk a bit about optimization because we could use the solver to solve this problem. We can use an optimization routine to solve this, this problem. But for now, I just want you to identify manually each routing configuration and then trying to select, trying to propose one that, that you know, allows this, this part. Okay, so the exercise is on the on my website. It's not yet on Blackboard. Okay, it's exercise set four, and you have there all the files, the Excel files for the problems the new version of the problem of the set, and then these instruct instructions on generating the FFT. Okay? So we have, just, just to summarize, today we have completed offshore structures. There are many different things you have to take into account, but I just give you an overview of the most important. The only thing we had missing was the marine environment. How does it affect the structure, the selection of the structure? So we had to characterize how do we characterize this part and how does it affect the movement, okay, the stresses on that part. And uh, yeah, so you're going to try to reinforce that with the exercise you have for today. Okay, any question before you start working on the exercise? No? Okay, so I suggest you start working and then I can help you if you if you have any questions.